All right. Welcome, everybody. It is Friday, September 20th, and today we have something great in store for you. I am Peter Antevi, and I have my host, uh, Tanner Smita. Dr. Paul Pepe is with us today, and uh, this is something that we've been following for some time. Um, Rado Rechev is one of a group of several physicians that you can see on the screen, a uh, stroke neurologist out of uh, the West Coast of the United States who has done something pretty incredible. And I wanted him to present it here on this platform because his audience, amongst other audiences, is EMS. And I wanted him to come in, present this information, and mainly because I wanted everybody on this call to give him like real feedback. Real feedback meaning as an EMS leader, as an EMS medical director, does this have value for you? Will you use this? Will your agency adopt something like this? He needs this kind of feedback moving forward. Um, and for those of you who are in EMS or in the hospital, we all do stroke uh, exams. And mainly we, here in South Florida, we use the race score. Some people use fast ED, some people use van. And the question is, could it be that there's technology that is better than the human being? And so, Without any further ado, uh, Dr. Rachev, take it away, and thank you so much for joining us here on the Florida EMS webinar. Thank you, Peter. I really appreciate the opportunity and uh, the nice introduction, mostly. <laughs> uh, so uh, my name is Radoslav Rachev. I'm a vascular and vascular neurologist. I practice at UCLA, and I am also a co-founder of a company that created the product that we're gonna show you. And we're gonna show you the research behind it. <clears throat> and I appreciate everyone's attention. This is a collaborative project between UCLA and my Bulgarian colleagues. So I'm originally from Bulgaria. This is what we did the study. Uh, this product is called Fast AI, an innovative technology for detection of stroke symptoms. And I'm pleased to present this on behalf of all my collaborators. Um, these are my disclosures. The main one is that I'm a co-founder of the uh, company that makes the product. Uh, we all know the problem with stroke. Stroke is very treatable if caught early. So most patients arriving three to six hours are salvageable. However, beyond six hours, very few patients are really treatable and salvageable, irrelevant of the stroke mechanism. Uh, but the real problem is that very few patients arrive in time to receive brain-saving treatments, mostly because of poor awareness and sometimes poor recognition and potentially poor triage by uh, EMS in some circumstances. Um, how do we improve stroke recognition? How do we enhance stroke recognition among the general population? We all know the FAST paradigm. It's a well-established paradigm uh, for patients and families to remember the most common signs of stroke. However, even after FAST campaigns were launched, uh, one in three uh, young adults who are supposed to remember well don't remember and don't know what FAST is. So FAST remains poorly uh, adopted effort to increase stroke awareness, but it's a good acronym for stroke recognition. And we thought instead of relying on a human intelligence to remember what fast is, can we use fast through smartphone and why smartphone? Um, well, smartphone is actually ubiquitous part of our daily lives. Uh, as of last year, eight, more than 80% of everyone in uh, the country uh, or all Americans have a smartphone. Uh, the average American spends five hours and 24 minutes per day on smartphone. And we check our sm smartphones 96 times per day. And worldwide, the number is even more astounding, 6.92 billion smartphone users. That's pretty significant. And this is, again, it was last year. Maybe this year's uh, these numbers are even higher. So our original idea was to bring FAST at home uh, for patient-oriented technology. <clears throat> but uh, as I'm just going to show you later in this presentation, we also find it used in an EMS so how and why we we thought this is possible because we know in in from real world examples that 
stroke can be detected through video uh, and audio recording. There's real life examples of FaceTimes and news anchors presenting uh, on video uh, being caught having a stroke before they even knew it. They had facial droop and slurred speech and proper action was taken and patients were saved. So what's fast AI? Well, it's a technology, like I said, smartphone enabled technology that detects facial symmetry, speech disturbance, and arm weakness using the technology embedded in the mobile devices. Uh, how do we do it? We uh, use a video recording, and out of that video, we extract the facial video and the voice recording, and we ask the patient to lift the phone with each arm for five sec for ten five to ten seconds, and that way we detect arm weakness. <clears throat> and the results are merged, and we finally provide output stroke or no stroke. And as I'm gonna show you later, we can also detect large vessel occlusion and, no, uh, and, and um, minor strokes. How does it work for facial asymmetry? So we use a specific, stroke-specific uh, 90 facial landmark key extraction algorithm that is accentuated on the nasolabial folds, upper and lower face, and we detect uh, unilateral changes of facial movement and asymmetry. This is how uh, it works or how is it annotated in a real patient. And you see this patient has a very obvious right facial droop and the orange bar is showing us that this is uh, over 80% uh, reliable. In other words, the facial asymmetry is present in over 80% of the frames of the video. How it works from the arms, we ask the patient again to lift the phone with each arm and we detect variance in the trajectory uh, via accelerometer, gyroscope and magnetometer. And you can see healthy versus unhealthy arm. The healthy arm is very linear, no noise, whereas the uh, unhealthy or weak arm has significant variance. This is the data from a gyroscope. Magnetometer is used to isolate the arms uh, in a prone position. So we want the arm to be that way. Uh, how it works from a speech standpoint, we use audio recording and use uh, specific sound variability pattern conduction analysis called MELF frequency spectrum coefficient, and we detect, again, variability of speech. Normal linear speech has very little variability. This is a graphic representation between the normal and affected speech, and you can see the frequency quite high on the affected speech. So we took this technology. We made the fast AI mobile app, and we asked physicians, neurologists, to validate this technology at the bedside on real stroke patients. And uh, we conducted this multi-center study in Bulgaria, where I'm from, um, and uh, every patient with a stroke or no stroke, I'm going to show the uh, selection criteria in the next slide, was tested with the fast AI mobile app. Every clinician annotated the results on every patient. Uh, at the bedside, and also provided neuroimaging data. And we continuously optimized the algorithms uh, as we went along, and we validated uh, on, through this ongoing research uh, the fast AI technology. And we continue to do it to this day. So far, we have about 500 patients in our data set. Uh, this is, uh, these are the centers that took part of the study, we have five centers. Now actually we're up to six. Uh, this is how we validated uh, uh, each output. In addition to bedside validation, we had clinical core lab validation. So uh, neurologist expert, uh, myself and my colleagues were reviewing every test and make sure that the test is valid. And this is how uh, the annotated test looks like from the back end. <clears throat> we see the video output with uh, a proper annotation of right-sided facial weakness. The neurologist properly annotated it as a right-sided weakness. We see right arm weakness based on the trajectory of the uh, mobile device uh, in the patient's arms. And uh, we listen to the video and we hear the patient actually has aphasia. And the imaging results are provided by the uh, <clears throat> physician at the bedside. So this is an example of a patient with a left middle cerebral artery ischemic stroke. And again, we're uh, annotating as valid. So uh, what were the selection criteria for this study? So all patients were adults. So we had patients with confirmed ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke within 72 hours of onset 
we use patients that are relatively mild to moderate with NIH stroke scales of one to 15. Uh, so we wanted the patients to have one of the three components of FAST. They must have had facial asymmetry or facial droop slit speech uh, and or myelophagia or arm weakness. We also used a sample of patients that have the most common stroke mimic, Bell's palsy. And in those patients, they had facial asymmetry, but stroke was excluded by imaging. So we wanted to train our AI to recognize stroke mimics from real strokes, just like a neurologist does. And we, of course, had healthy controls. In other words, patients who had suspected strokes, but actually had no clinical deficits. Uh, exclusion criteria were patients who are unable to participate at all in the test, were mute or unable to comprehend, patient who had uh, <clears throat> complete hemiplegia, or they had to be able to lift the phone to a certain degree so we can at least describe the weakness, and patient who had symptomatic hemorrhagic conversion with ischemic strokes. So we wanted to keep the data clean. We wanted to have ischemic strokes and hemorrhagic strokes separately. Uh, this is the study population that was used for this particular uh, study. So we, like I said, we have up to 500 patients in the data set, but we analyzed up to 400 patients. Um, most <clears throat> patients uh, were uh, had ischemic strokes. Uh, we had about 10% patients with hemorrhage. With I'm sorry, with Bell's palsy. We had about uh, 70 patients with. Uh, no deficits, in other words, healthy controls, about 20% of the patient populations. And we use 70-30 split for training and validation. This is a very classic approach in machine learning. So about 70% of patients were used to train the algorithms, and about 30% of these patients were used to validate the algorithms. These are case examples of facial asymmetry detection. So you see this patient has very subtle, barely recognizable left lower facial droop. And I think this is where the value of the technology is really. Uh, when the patient is asked to elicit some facial movements to detect facial asymmetry, the AI is properly picking it <clears throat> and showing us that this on the patient's left side. See the purple bar showing his patient's side. The orange bar is showing us probability of symptoms. Mm -hmm. This on the right here is patient with a very obvious right lower facial droop. As you can see, the AI immediately is recognizing its patient's right and is showing us 100% certainty of uh, true uh, symptoms. Uh, this is a, our central versus peripheral facial asymmetry, in other words, stroke versus Bell's palsy uh, algorithm. This patient has upper and lower facial involvement. That is a sign of Bell's palsy, not stroke. So when you have upper and lower face paralysis, that's Bell's palsy. And this patient has upper lower facial weakness that immediately is picked up by the AI as peripheral, in other words, Bell's palsy. Now this patient has a central pattern of weakness or stroke related facial asymmetry and the AI is recognizing it properly as central or stroke because it's only involving the lower face. This is the final output where we combine all the bars. We have a symmetry bar, we have sidebar and we have Bell's palsy versus stroke bar and this patient has uh, left-sided Bell's palsy. Okay, what are the results of our study? Uh, these are, uh, the this is the performance of the AI uh, from cross-validation. So we have sensitivity specificity for each modality. As you can see, each modality exceeds 70%. The most sensitive and specific is the facial asymmetry modality. Uh, when you look at Bell's palsy, <clears throat> sensitivity specificity, it exceeds 70%, 78 and 70, still not where I want it to be. I want it to be 99, uh, so we need just more data. But when you combine each modality and merge them together, the stroke, sensitivity specificity, the combined uh, three approaches uh, is above 90%, so it's pretty high. If you take a look at a published data, meta-analyses from human performing FAST or fast ED tests in the ambulance or the ER. So these were paramedics or ER physicians, non-neurologists who are utilizing the FAST approach at the bedside. The sensitivity and specificity was 77 and 60. So the human data, retrospective human data, is actually not as good as our AI-enabled data. What are the limitations of this study? All FAST-AI tests were performed by neurologists. Investigators were aware of the patient's diagnosis. 
They were all neurologists knowing what the patient had. All tests were performed in a homogeneous environment in the hospitals. Uh, with this, uh, when the patient is laying in bed <clears throat> and um, with the same sort of lightning and, and so, sort, of, sort of same environment. <clears throat> but in conclusion, AI can reliably identify acute stroke features and differentiate from Bell's palsy with accuracy comparable to neurologist clinical impression. I think we can conclude this from our study. How do we see this technology being used? We, someone told me this is an EKG for stroke. I love this. I think this is a great idea to call it that way, the EKG for stroke, Clinic, clinician aid technology. So we, in other words, we're replicating the neurologist in patients in, in, in the, at your pocket. Um, so using the AI to detect things that neurologists can detect easily. Um, so this could be an EMS and telemedicine environment. Uh, we really think the value is in the patient-oriented technology because essentially any human being can be trained to perform an all EMS personnel. I highly, I, I, I highly respect EMS and I speak to EMS physician, uh, EMS personnel all the time. I talk to paramedics every day and I believe that paramedics are very good in uh, detecting stroke if they're trained properly. Uh, but the idea here is really to systemize it and do it the same way all the time with the aid of the AI. Uh, but really, I think the big value down the line is the self-assessment for acute and chronic deficits at home um, and ambient monitoring detection and so-called IoT smart home video conferencing and even autonomous driving vehicles. If you ask me how the future holds, is like if you're driving an autonomous driving vehicle and you have a God forbid, have a stroke and a fast AI is watching you and detecting that you're having a severe stroke, an autonomous driving vehicle will directly drive you to the proper place where comprehensive strokes are. But that's a futuristic uh, view. Uh, so I'm going to show you how we wrapped up the product for EMS-oriented technology. This is a little uh, commercial video uh, presented by my colleague, Rajesh. Is here? Yes. Yes. We're going to assess a patient's exam who has a severe stroke with right-sided weakness, some expressive aphasia, and able to comprehend commands using the Fast AI EMS app. And so now we're going to start the test, and you want to be sure to point the camera at the patient's face, and we'll hit start. And Robert, raise your eyebrows, and show me your teeth. And close your eyes tight. It's calculating the result. It correctly assessed for the side of weakness and identified as a stroke. Now it asks the paramedic to rotate the phone in order to test for speech. And be sure to point the phone to the side where the patient is looking, especially if there's a gaze or eye deviation. And we start the test. It instructs the paramedic to hold the phone directly in front of the patient. Robert, please read the following words out loud. Please describe the following picture. And it's important to perform through the exam despite the patient's deficits. Please count the number of stars on the following screen. Please follow the dot on the following screen. Okay, and tells the medic to rotate the phone back and it correctly detected the gaze. And now we're going to test for arm weakness. There is a sensor on the patient's right wrist that is Bluetooth enabled, and it communicates via the Fast EMS app to assess for trajectory of the arm movement in order to reliably indicate whether there is any weakness. We hit start test. We ask the patient to rest their right arm and now lift it up for 10 seconds. And Robert, please hold up your left arm directly in front of you. Good. And for a full 10 second count, two, one, zero. Good. After using the Fast AI app to further assess my stroke patient, I found it very simple to use, easy to navigate, 
and it gave me a pretty correct reading of what my patient's race score would have been. All right, Davey Fire Rescue. <laughs> That's so cool. So, <laughs> awesome. yeah, thank you. With uh, this presentation, I hope I convinced you that digital transformation and artificial intelligence is the future of healthcare. We kind of know that already, and we believe the future is now. And thank you very much. I'm here to take questions. All right, great. All right, this is perfect. So that's a perfect setup. Uh, and we, we see your screens, Ferrado, just unshare. Okay, just a second. Yeah. Uh, so th this is th this is perfect because you know um, I didn't realize you were going to show the demo, which is great. But so now I would like to um, what what I promised you anyway is that I would at least have people on here that would try to poke holes in in the theory. So uh, I know there's some great people on this call. Um, is there anybody out there? Uh, let's go to Tanner, my partner in crime, and then we're going to go uh, over to any other uh, anybody else. But Tanner, you you saw the research, you saw the application. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on this app? And Rado, we still see the back of your screen, by the way. I'm trying to figure out how to unshare it. I'm sorry. Let me see. Uh, you know what I'll do? I'll, I'll, I'll take I it stopped, away from uh, you there again. There you go. I'm stopping share. Okay, there we go. Okay. Perfect. You're good now. Mm -hmm. Tanner, you're on. All right. Yeah. First of all, wonderful presentation. Um, I love the idea of kind of a, a standardized, objective way um, to, to assess strokes for, for EMS patients. Um, I, I really think it's a it's a brilliant idea. I think that this is a this has phenomenal uh, potential. Uh, just just a couple things I was thinking of in terms of generalizability to to EMS and in EMS systems of care um, is you know first of all right in EMS we're we're assessing patients in a variety of environments right we find them in a, in various positions with different light levels um, when it comes to um, kind of speech patterns right in the united states even you know even though it's primarily english language speaking there's dialects in different regions um, that that might lead to some need for for validation in populations with different accents and dialects um, and so you know in addition kind of the population we see um, might be a little bit less clean and kind of the population that this has been validated in thus far, right? We have patients that are altered, patients that have trouble following commands. Um, one thing that I was thinking about is uh, patients with, with dentures. Um, sometimes they can have, you know, quote unquote, slurred speech, even though they, that might be, might be their baseline. Um, and so, you know, uh, again, really the only thing I would say is I think it needs to be, you know, validated in the pre-hospital setting and, and, and used by EMS providers, which I'm sure, you know, you have, you have plans to accomplish, um, but yes. really wonderful technology. And, and I think it's really admirable what you've done here. Thank you. Appreciate the feedback. Excellent feedback. Uh, this is, we, we've thought about all these aspects. It's very valid. Has to be, uh, the technology has to be retrained on different accents, different racial backgrounds. Uh, in different environments, um, hundred <clears throat> percent. Yeah. Yep. Great, great comment. Um, let's see. I want to hear from some other. I, I know there are folks on the call who are in stroke. Um, oh, we have we have some questions coming up on the chat here. Sorry, here we go. Sorry, I'm, I didn't see that. Um, Don says, "Looks like a great tool. I like the speech visual assessment. Any concerns about assessing patients with dark skin tones? Has this been an issue with facial recognition software?" Right excellent, excellent questions. Uh, we actually don't have a lot of dark skin tone in our database. We do have some, but not a whole lot. And we haven't seen any problem with it. We need, again, we need more sample. Uh, we have been approached by various uh, countries now to, to expand our product. And, you know, in Japan and Colombia, it's definitely we're going to do it here in UCLA. Uh, so we we'll, we have to use more, high, uh, more variable data sets. To, to retrain it can easily be retrained. Look, once you accomplish a, a way of training the AI, feeding with an annotated data, and that's how machine learning is. You just have to extract the data, annotate, classify it, and, and then allow the technology to, to receive it and, and, and to, you know, to use the neural networks to train it again and to provide proper output. At the end of the day, sometimes even my AI experts say, I really don't know what's going on there. It recognizes it and gives me the data as long as we, we train it properly, right? It's just like the human brain. It's pretty outstanding what AI can do. Uh, that's a great, great question. Great answer. This is a great question from uh, one of your colleagues, Adam, who's now a medical student in the uh, University of Miami Medical School, but he's from UCLA. So mm -hmm. and he cannot turn on his microphone, but he says he has a great question, which is, any opportunities to integrate this with video 911, especially now that Apple 
just came out. I heard uh, with um, Rapid SOS is a technology in the dispatch center that they will now allow people with an iPhone, sorry, Android users, to actually see your video um, while you're talking to 911. So that mm -hmm. that's actually a fascinating concept, right? Where the telecommunicator says, okay, just hold the phone, do X, Y, and Z, and then they're getting the readout of whether it's yeah. a stroke or not. Any comments on that kind of partnership? I think this is, we haven't done this partnership, but this is exactly excellent, excellent uh, scenario where <laughs> fast AI can be plugged in. Um, our vi video enabled facial de uh, asymmetry detection is platform independent. You can plug it in any scenario. I can plug it right now into Zoom uh, because it goes to a cloud and it's very easy. Now, if you use an iPhone specific technology, we, we can do that as well because the iPhone, um, uh, Facial facial analysis is way more more detailed than our ninety landmark uh, landmarks extraction point, uh, but 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 for our standpoint, what we have is pretty sufficient to detect facial asymmetry. So the answer, the short answer is yes, a hundred percent. Very nice. Uh, let me bring in Lou Steinberg with a question. Lou, go ahead. Um, well, I have my hole puncher, which you asked for. So, um, as you know, most of our newer cl cl clinicians, sorry are overly reliant on technology, which works until technology doesn't, when your phone doesn't start or whatever. You know, they're saying, when in doubt, examine the patient. So since we've gone to be fast, a lot of people confuse stroke screening with stroke severity. Raises the stroke severity, but you need a very fast one minute stroke screening before you set any of this up. Yup, it's a stroke. Let's issue that stroke alert to the hospital. I see this as a better secondary tool, when we get to race, when we get to picking up what we might have missed initially to confirm mm -hmm. and expand upon that and get to your race plus score. Just a side, side note on the Bell's palsy, um, I wrote it in just a recent set of guidelines that if a patient just has facial droop, do the eyebrow test. That pretty much narrows down and eliminates that. Um, so just my comments on that. But again, it's the over-reliance on technology. We need to make sure our people know what to do when it doesn't work. Oh, 100%. I, I, look, I cannot agree more. I'm a neurologist. My father is a neurologist. My grandfather is a neurologist. And mm -hmm. all of them, um, they were working back in the day when there was no CT scans and they were diagnosing stroke based on clinical exam. You know, would I say that my grandfather would flip in a grade to see what I'm doing? No, I don't believe so. We're just enhancing the clinical acumen of everyone out there and retraining them and, 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 and helping. I think if you think about it, uh, many people were saying back in the day, well, once we invented the MRI, you don't need a neurologist anymore. The MRI is telling you where the stroke is. Why do you need a neurologist, right? There's always that clinical bedside uh, art of medicine that is absolutely needed in every patient encounter. And our app is actually made, to, at least the EMS app is made such a way that uh, everything can be overridden by the, by the clinician at the bedside. Right. Great, great answer. I'm, I'm going to pick on it. Just, we only have a few minutes. I want to pick on a few people because I, I, I want to get some pointed questions here for you, Rado. So, Joseph Zalkin, are you there? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm here. Okay, so you you ran a very large agency for a long time, Wake EMS, big agency, very well respected. Um, you're still you're still going strong nationally. Um, someone comes to you and says, uh, Joseph, I want this thing in in Wake County EMS. What do you say as the guy writing the check? <laughs> well, I want to see the clinical background first. But yeah, just, just some key points. Multiple language. I, I know there was a point in the assessment where the patient speaks. So we have a large Spanish uh, Spanish speaking population, variants like that. Uh, trial for sure. Uh, what uh, a key question I have with AI in general is what happens to these assessments? Are they held for retraining of the system or do they disappear after the test? No, they, they are held for retraining. Yeah, they're, they're held for retraining. Every patient, now, right now, the way it's done right now is always a, there's a clinic, clinician annotating it. Okay, so what you saw as an example, as a demo, it's not really actually ready so it's just a demo the video but the real product the, the 
the data gathering app right now, every test is annotated by a neurologist because we haven't launched it in, in the EMS yet. Um, and, and we do have a Spanish, you know, you can select when you, the, the, the product that we have as a demo, you can select your language and we have a Spanish and English version. So if you, if I were to be just completely frank, the accuracy and the reliability of the, of the actual app hasn't been tested, hasn't been validated in, in EMS. It's just a project. Okay. What I showed you was all clinician bedside annotated and every patient is well annotated. It, it's, it's, it is exciting technology, especially for those of us in the stroke belt in the South, where we see a large number of uh, stroke patients. We also have other systems like ultrasound being tested in the field for LVO detection. Uh, I think it's a great project for stroke centers to pay for to place in EMS. I uh, thank you for this comment. I don't know if people actually saw the video and I forgot to actually uh, um, accentuate on that is that at the end of the test, you actually send the results via email, text message, however, whatever platform you're using to the receiving center. So receiving center actually receives the file and they can play it. And you know, also you can, if I'm, a, I'm, I'm a, honestly, I as a physician would love to get proper identification early and, and, and hear about it and get to my, because I'm a neurointerventionist, so I do thrombectomies, to hear from you and knowing that it's a real stroke patient there, I, I can get my door device time in, in 10, 15 minutes if I know up front. So if I receive a, a good, uh, reliable technology with good um, uh, evidence or video or, or some sort of like imaging that I can see that, hey, yeah, this is a real patient, I know to go. Yeah. So you're right. You know, I, 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 in my in my opinion, the hospital should pay for, but it's 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 a uh, you know it's a uh, it's tough to to penetrate that. <clears throat> right. The real the real question here for me is, and for everybody on the call is, is there a threshold where this where fast AI can detect strokes to a X percentage accuracy? Is there a threshold which beyond that everyone says you have to use it because you know we we know that the race. In the published studies, it was like, I think the initial study for race was like 60 something percent for LVO, for LVO, mm -hmm. only in the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, the, all those studies have never shown that it can get up above into the 80s and 90s. And so mm -hmm. I, I, I think that if you can have a product that can elevate that number, because listen, we're in a very urban environment, but people like in Polk County um, or you know, areas where they would have to fly out that LVO, which is what they do today in some areas, you're getting a helicopter, it's a ten, fifteen thousand dollar bill, and they get there and it's a stroke mimic and you were wrong. <laughs> so th there there is some very expensive decisions being made based and, and if the AI can really perform at a much higher level, I think that's the ROI all of a sudden becomes much more tangible, in my opinion. You know what I'm saying? Yes, yes. I agree. So, uh, okay. So uh I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Tanner take us out, and then Rada, we're gonna give you the last word. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. But uh, Tanner, take us away, and then Rada, we're gonna give you the last word, and we're all gonna go to Dr. Pepe's webinar. So thank you guys so much. Yeah, thank, okay. thank you. For oh, go ahead. Uh, right, yeah, Tanner. To say thank you again for your presentation. I think we we all look forward to validation and EMS systems in the United States and and worldwide. We look forward to to reading your sensitivity and specificity and positive predictive value, et cetera, in the future. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tanner. Thank you, Peter. I appreciate your attention. I hope to continue to be engaged with you guys and continue the collaboration. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Well, the fact that you use Davey Fire Rescue, you're you're in. We're gonna we're gonna continue to uh <laughs> and, and in all seriousness, we have a very big community of people who, you know, in EMS, everybody wants to do the right thing. We want to do the best for our patients. We want to have the best outcome. So if you need anything from us, let us know. We're always here for you. Thank, Thank you, Rado. You. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Tanner just put the uh, link in the chat for Dr. Pepe's webinar. Uh, I'm going to join that remotely as I get back into the car. Uh, that was great. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.